Hello everyone, I am Dweather Dude. Welcome back. And today we have our second 2021 hurricane season forecast and discussion. So without further ado, let's get into the video. Stay tuned for the whole video and enjoy. Before we get started with the video though, if you guys have not already, please consider subscribing. It really does help my channel grow. I want to thank you guys so much for 2,000 subscribers. We've flown past and hopefully we can hit our next goal of 3,000 subscribers soon. And also to help this video reach more people, please consider liking and sharing it as well. And let's get into the video now. So yes, I've been trying to do these every week. So like the last, the first discussion I did was on the fifth, um, and today's the twelfth, and we're doing it one week later now. For the third, for the third video, um, we're gonna have because the in, the latest NSO outlook comes out on the sixteenth, and the last one they did was like on the second. So by the time we the third hurricane season discussion video comes out, hopefully we'll have the latest ENSO updates. Uh, so that'll be really good for um, our forecast. But we still there were still some changes that occurred over the past week, and I. Definitely worth noting talking about today, so let's jump right into it. Now, most of the ENSO stuff that we're going over here really hasn't changed. Of a more of a review to go over, and also maybe some people are watching now that haven't seen the first video. This is a chance for you guys to see as well. So March, um, again, 0.6, like a week La Nina, same thing for May. Uh, and July over the summer is when it could possibly go back up to a neutral. Again, this is all from like the most of this is from the Borough Meteorology website. Um, but there, but there are some different maps and different graphs that could say something different, even if it's on the same website. All right, so this is the latest run. Again, this will probably be updated on the 16th. But this is updated very end of February. Um, as you can see, according to this, now again, remember what they consider what the because it's Australia, remember. So what they consider La Nina and El Nino is different than what we consider. So technically, we're like right in between a weak La Nina and neutral. We might actually might be coming out of. La Nina, because I looked at the equatorial Pacific and I started to see some slightly above average waters mix in with the blues. So that that tells me we're going more towards a neutral pattern. I wouldn't be surprised if we're there now. But again, just because it warms up quickly to neutral doesn't mean it is neutral. It has to stay there for a certain period of time for it to officially be declared neutral. Even though we're seeing ENSO neutral conditions right now. Um, forecast to go up and not really go in El Nino. El Nino is not forecast. A good chunk of models... Do bring us close to 0.4, but like I not in El Nino range by any means. Um, maybe above the zero line, but still staying within um the neutral boundaries. Now, this is now this did update though. This is the uh southern oscillation index, and what this indicates, right? So you see the graph um on the left, right? It goes up to 20. I don't know why it's obscured like that, but 20 is the top number, all right? Increments of five. And what this means is so I put a text here. So this text is actually straight from the Burr Meteorology website. Like this is literally how they explain it, all right. So basically what it is, is a sustained positive SOI above eight indicate a La Nina event or La Nina conditions, while sustained negative values about negative eight or lower indicate El Nino, right? So eight, I would say, so if I have six, seven, so this is eight right here. Uh, and you can see we've been, I would say we've been above that for a good amount of time, right? So that's your, where your La Nina is, all right? And then anything in between eight and negative eight, I would assume is neutral, right? Uh, so, ne so negative 8 would be 6, 7. So this is negative 8. And you can see earlier, right, there was maybe some more El Nino. Now, this doesn't determine La Nina or El Nino. This is just one of the factors, right? The fact that we're, you know, on the positive side does indicate um, indicate La Nina. But if it's above 8, that really, that's a strong indicator of La Nina, which is like right here. That's the 8 line right there. All right, so that's the SOI. That did update. And the latest 30-day value was an increase by 6, uh, 6 units. We'll just call them units. Um, last video, I'm pretty sure this number was 10. Um, so it, as you can see, it has, uh, has dropped a little bit, but still above the zero line. All right. Now this, I believe really hasn't updated again. I'm pretty sure this will be updated on the 16th as well. But as a review, you can see most models are like on the, on the negative side of neutral close to lining. If not hitting it, April, May, we start backing down a little bit, right? Most models get closer to the zero line. All right. And you can see the mean. Uh, which means an average of all the models, all seven of these models that you see here. And and the severe weather, by the way, has been upgraded to enhanced. Uh, just as a little um just as a little note in case you guys don't know. So hopefully hopefully I'll be doing an update on that tomorrow. All right. Enhanced severe weather threat now. There it's looking a lot more significant for the severe weather threat in Texas and Oklahoma. 
Um, but as we head towards June, now you can see a couple models above the zero line, a couple models below. But again, all in all, we're still in that ENSO neutral phase. Like 0.5, because remember, we consider El Nino as 0.5, they, Australia is 0.8. So 0.5 is like, I'd say right here. And no model really gets even close to that, let alone close to 0.8 by any means. All right, so as we head towards July, again, it, all models except the NOAA really don't have us in anything but a neutral. Now, I want to look at the top is, I like, so this is the most recent one right here. All right, this is March 11, 2021. Obviously, we can't get today's data yet because today hasn't finished. But the top is this time last year because we know that 2020 was such an active hurricane season. So I like to look at how does RC, RC service temperatures now compare to at what they were at this time last year. Um, and one thing I do, I will say looks very different is the Pacific. I, the Equatorial Pacific does look pretty different, but also the, um, is this, yeah, the North Pacific, right? Look at this region right here and look at it last year, right? A lot more blue this year. So the Pacific itself is cooler, right? Because remember, La Nina favors a cooler Equatorial Pacific, right? But also a cooler North Pacific, right? And that's what favors the warmer Atlantic, usually, all right? So the one thing I will say, though, there was a lot of warmer air off or warmer water off the coast of Africa, which you don't quite see this year. But again, it's March. Right? Hurricane season starts in like May, June. We got uh, what about one and a half months or so, right? All right. No, I'm sorry. Two and a half months, maybe. But don't worry, because activity will start before that. Um, usually we have we've had a lot past few years. We've had I think it's the past like five plus years in a row where we've just had um, tropical systems before June 1st. So it's becoming a common thing now. I wouldn't be surprised because if you, if you look at the Pacific, their official hurricane season starts May 15th, whereas the Atlantic is June 1st. I wouldn't be surprised if they made the Atlantic May 15th as well. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but there was a lot more blue here uh, than there was last year. Last year was a La Nina kind of transitioning to neutral, but we were in so or excuse me, neutral to La Nina. Um, and we're more of a La Nina still, as you can see this year, but now it's weakening. Look at the orange splotches, the yellow splotches like I showed you earlier, right? And even towards the Nino 1, this is the Nino 3, 4 region. This is what really determines... Uh, El Nino or La Nina, but even the Nino 1, 2 towards the east, you can see it's starting to warm up now too. All right, so definitely something to keep uh, a watch over for sure. Uh, if we zoom in more towards the Caribbean and the southeast coast, as you can see, um, I will say like the Gulf of Mexico does look a good deal warmer, at least the central Gulf does, than it did this time last year. So that's a factor. Um, Caribbean uh, doesn't look all too different. Actually, it pretty much almost looks identical than it did this time last year. Maybe ever so slightly cooler, like 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 a fra like a fraction of a like a fraction of a degree, like maybe even less than that, right? Pretty much identical. You can see a mix of oranges and blues here for the Western Atlantic here. Not much uh, different looking. Although I will say between I uh, between latitude sixty or is that sorry longitude between longitude sixty and fifty, right? So in this zone right here, I will say it looks a lot warmer um, this year than it does last year, but. Just watch certain sections of the ocean, right? Definitely looks different. It's something to watch. Um, if we look at the Saharan air layer, right? Of course, it's still going to be high, right? It, this will probably remain high all the way through. It won't probably start dropping until July. Right? Because remember, we don't see activity forming out here until later July, August, September, right? Before that, and even after that, the activity will be close to home. Usually, not all the time. Um, now, there is some reduced dry air that could just be because that there's a storm system there and it might be... There could still be dry air there, and you just can't really see it because the storm's on top. Right, like in these blue areas, right, this is where there's no dry air. So actually, by the Lesser Antilles um, and just to the east, there's some, but not very much dry air in that zone right there. It's reduced, right? Not like the mega dry air you see out here by Africa and in the Gulf of Mexico. Right? So dry air in some areas, like even you can see, now this could change within a, a couple days, but dry air even in the Eastern Caribbean, it's low, not moderate to high. I'd say it's on the lower side. All right. Now, this is basically convection. Now, it is, I would say it's a little early to show this map because usually we don't see tropical. We have seen hurricane in March way, way back when, years and years ago, like probably, I would even say more than 100 years ago even, I think. I'm not sure. But there was definitely a Category 2 hurricane in March. But anyway, this shows the convective, um, the convective, like how much convection is in the tropics, right? The green means, means more thunderstorms to convection, therefore more development, whereas the brownish, orangish, reddish is like the opposite. All right. Now, of course, this just this still does show the tropical act, the thunderstorm activity, but that this because it's March, I don't think any green out here means we're going to see more tropical development. 
if this map were to look like this in say July or August, then yes. But as of now, no. But if you look on the on the left, because as you can see, Africa is on left and right sides of the map, right? So if you look on the left, this is also Africa. And over in mainland Africa, because you have to remember that I would say most, uh, either 99 or 100 percent of the tropical activity of the storms, like out of the 100 percent of the storms that come from Africa, all right, they usually form as thunderstorms starting in mainland Africa. That's pretty much the source, right? And over this region, where the storms originate from, there is some green shading there right now as well. And this is effective now through March 19th. Now, as for close to home, it's a lot of usual thunderstorm activity, even a little bit reduced by the uh, by Bermuda, if the, if the GF, GEFS is right. If you look at the CFS, is now the 19th through the 26th. We're switching models here. Um, Caribbean, tropical Atlantic as, as a whole, not very uh, medium shades of green. Not very dark shades of green, but there is a lot, right? But look at mainland Africa. Look, look at all the darker greens there, right? That means a lot of thunderstorm activity over Africa. So look for some wetter times potentially in Africa. And if this were a couple months later or a few months later, you would see um, activity heading out into, into the uh, Atlantic. Uh, tropical cyclone heat potential, looking at this, inserting the latest uh, image compared to last week. I'm not seeing too many changes. I didn't see too many at all. You guys probably don't notice too many changes either. Um, but still, on the low, between low and moderate side for the Caribbean, uh, no really heat in the Gulf yet. I mean, the temperatures are okay. Sea surface temperatures in the 70s um, in the Gulf, maybe in the southern portion, like down here, maybe in the 80s. But no really tropical heat to be found Atlantic or Gulf yet. Give it about a month, though, and it's going to look a lot different, trust me. Uh, tropical cyclone genesis. Oops, sorry. Uh, tropical cyclone genesis. Now, they all, now, this says like 50, 60% chance of uh, tropical systems in the southwestern. Uh, Gulf of Mexico, I don't think that, or the Bay of Campeche, you can call it as well. Um, but I don't think there's going to be any tropical development at all. Um, this, the, These models, like this, like this has been sitting, that same pink zone has been sitting there forever. All right, this basically shows you, like that any kind, on this map, any kind of thunderstorm activity, they'll say it has a chance of tropical development, right? Like there's a storm out in the Atlantic right now, but they're giving that a chance of development. I really don't think there is going to be anything personally. Um, of course, because of the wind shear. Now, this does look different. Um, if you notice, right? On the last week, this was all covered in red pretty much, right? Like the whole Atlantic Basin, right? I'm actually, I might switch to a uh, lime color for this just so you can see it better. Um, but the Central Caribbean, you'll see another wind shear map I'll show you as well. It's just a sign, but the Central, because the green, if you look at the green lines, that means favorable wind shear, right? Like where it's low enough for development. Yellow means it's okay, like manageable, but not the best. And then red means not favorable at all for development, right? In terms of shear. Um, there is a little bit of a yellow area that used to be all red forming in the northern central Caribbean. Also, portions of the North Atlantic, we're seeing some more yellow development up there, um, but not nothing too. But this does get my attention, what's in the Caribbean, right? And you can see the knots, right? 20, even the red, 25 and 30 is considered in the red, but 25 knots, 30 is kind of bad, but 25 isn't so bad either. 20, 25, you could probably handle after that, probably not. Again, if it's a Cat 5 hurricane, it could probably take more wind shear than a tropical depression or a tropical storm, right? And you can see, look, let me, oh, wait, I want to change the color. There we go. So you can see just what I was talking about here, even in the southwestern Gulf as well. This goes out there, right? Anywhere in those green regions, in between 20 and 25 knots of shear. So we've seen a lot of reduced shear, and you can see by the blue colors where shear has dropped between 10 and 25 knots within the past 24 hours. Even in the North Atlantic, we're seeing a lot of drop in shear as well, right? Now, there is still a lot of shear. Yes, again, it's March. It's supposed to be like that. But the fact that we're already seeing areas that are dropping in shear, that may, now this may not last. This will probably get filled back in eventually anyway. But the fact that it's March and this is already starting to happen does worry me. But on the tropical Atlantic, there's still tons and tons of wind shear. Just think of this video as like an off-season discussion, if you will. So look at the, look how tightly wound up this storm got in the Atlantic, right? Nothing tropical, but uh, in the front, this is draped along the front. And then there is some moisture, some... A precipitable water heading westbound. All right, you can't really see it too well on the satellite, uh, but there is some precipitable water moving through the Atlantic. Um, there's a there is a moist flow coming from the Gulf that's setting up the severe weather uh, for the next couple of days. If we look at the Caribbean, right, last couple of maps here. If we look at the Caribbean again, the black line is our average shear, and you can see we have spent much more time below that average line than we have above. So even though the shear is high, like it's supposed to be, it is still technically according to this below average all right and that's that's an indicator also even the tropical atlantic 
I would definitely say looking at this, we have spent more time near the, the zero line just because of up and down, up and down. Um, but we have definitely gotten below plenty of times, and we're actually below that black line, that average line right now. All right, so again, just as a review, same two maps from the last video. Above average is what the – this is from the Colorado State University. This is judging by the accumulated cyclone energy, like the or it's called ACE as well. Now, according to that, above average season looks the most likely, right? Um, the second most likely option will be near average, but near average and extremely active are both very close together as well. But the greatest chance is for an above average season. Not extreme like 2020, but the latest calls for an above average season. All right. And again, on the right, on C, this is not CSU's official forecast. This is what they call a definition of an above average season, which is why I put that in there. So my outlook, 13 to 16 named storms, 7 to 9 hurricanes, 2 to 4 major hurricanes. Um, with the latest NSO uh, data that comes out next video, I might change. Um, I might change my forecast depending on if I need to or not. Uh, we'll see if this needs changing. Uh, CSU, 12 to 15 named storms, 6 to 8 hurricanes, 2 to 3 major. So overall, it's a pretty it's a pretty close to average year, right? But still above average and possibly overall as it looks so far. Can't wait to see you guys in the next video. Thank you guys for watching. Stay tuned for updates. I am the Weather Dude signing off. Till next time, I will catch you guys in the next video.